Today we're going to talk about a heinous evil that Muslims brought forth on this earth. Something so vile that it brings shock and horror in the hearts and minds of millions of people today. We're going to expose Islam for the terrible things it has contributed to. It all started with a book. Today, children are indoctrinated with its teachings, whether they want it or not, in dozens of countries. A book so dark that its mere name brings fear in the hearts of millions around the planet. This is getting too dark. Let's just cue the intro. It all started with a man named Muhammad. No, not that one. I mean Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. However, before we talk about him, we should discuss how mathematics arrived in the Islamic world. Before 750 CE, there was hardly ever any stability in the Islamic world. Three civil wars happened in between 640 CE and 650 CE, not including the Abbasid revolution. Hence, there wasn't much work being done. There were some collections and a light version of the translation movement going on, but nothing too serious. After the Abbasid revolution, during the reign of Al-Mansur, an interesting book arrived in Baghdad, probably with the Indian scholar who brought it. It is only remembered as Zijal Sindh Hind by the Arabs who wrote about it, but it is generally considered to have been called Siddhanta, which means treatise in Sanskrit. It was an Indian book on astronomy. Al-Mansur ordered its translation into Arabic from its original Sanskrit. Greek works were also being translated into Arabic in Baghdad. Around the same time, probably in 780 CE, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi was born. He was born in Khwarizm in Central Asia. Technically, he was a Persian. Al-Tabari even calls him Al-Majusi in his books, hinting to the fact that he might have been a Zoroastrian. But Al-Khwarizmi started his books by praising Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, so it's unlikely that he was a Zoroastrian. According to some sources, he was the eldest of the famous Banu Musa brothers, but that's probably not true. A story for another time though. Throughout his life, Al-Khwarizmi wrote various treatises, the earliest of which are clearly based on Zijal Sindh Hind and some works of Brahmagupta, an Indian mathematician who had died in the middle of the 7th century. It was Brahmagupta who invented zero and the decimal number system. However, while Al-Khwarizmi accepted the usage of zero, he did not quite use negative numbers, which had also been introduced by Brahmagupta. In fact, the Arabs didn't quite use them at all, initially. Any equation that would result in a negative number was simply ignored by Islamic scholars. Part of it was because of the practicality of mathematics in the Arab mind. Al-Khwarizmi was one of, if not the first person to use zero as a means to increase a number tenfold. Add a zero next to two and it becomes 20. The idea was not widely accepted, even as late as the Renaissance. In the early 9th century, around 820 CE, Al-Khwarizmi wrote a book which only survives in a Latin translation from the 12th century because the Arabic one has been lost through time. The Latin version is called Al-Khwarizmi on the Hindu Art of Reckoning, which is a really cool title for an RPG or a young adult novel. In his book, he laid out a full account of the Hindu numerals. He did not claim to have invented those or anything. He gave references which weren't properly translated by later European translators. Hence, the numeral system in Europe came to be attributed to his name as algorithmi and later algorithm, a term which now refers to the rules of a procedure and haunts the dreams of many YouTubers. An interesting side note here. The Hindu numerals arrived in the Muslim world through Zijal Sidh Hind. Before it, the locals used their local systems. The Greek, Persian and Egyptian systems were most prominently used. After the arrival of Hindu numerals, many didn't want to transition to it. Thabit ibn Qura, another mathematician of the 9th century, received considerable opposition from his pro-Greek community for his pro-Arabic sympathies and using the Hindu numerals when he was a Syrian and Syria was heavily Greek, at least in culture and language at the time. The Hindu numeral system varied quite a bit throughout the Muslim world and even today there is an alternate system used in many Islamic countries. Like most innovations in the Islamic world, it arrived in Europe through Spain. In 970s, Codex Vigilanus was written in Spain and it's the first known European manuscript to use the Arabic numerals. By the 14th century, the rich Italian merchants were using it and so everyone started using it as well. The Europeans, since they took it from a Persian and didn't know the difference between Arab and Persian, called it the Arabic numeral system. More recently, the Hindus are getting their due credit though, and it's being called the Hindu-Arabic numeral system. 
so the Hindu numerals, which were indeed superior, won out over the Greek numerals in the end, just like T-Series did. Is that meme still relevant? In the 830s, Al-Mamun wrote a letter to Al-Khwarizmi, who was either employed as a scholar or as the head of the House of Wisdom at the time. In the letter, Al-Mamun encouraged him to compose a short work on calculating by the rules of completion and reduction. He intended it to serve all kinds of purposes, from inheritance distribution to trade, and even in regards to architectural projects like digging canals. This resulted in Al-Khwarizmi writing a book known as Al-Kitab al-Mukhtasir fi Hisab al-Jabr wal-Muqabila. In English, this would be the short book on calculation by completion and balancing a book that became a household name in Western Europe a few centuries later, as Carl Boyer writes in A History of Mathematics. Diophantus is sometimes called the father of algebra, but this title, more appropriately, belongs to Al-Khwarizmi. It is true that in two respects, the work of Al-Khwarizmi represented a retrogression from that of Diophantus. First, it is on a far more elementary level than that found in Diophantine problems, and second, the algebra of Al-Khwarizmi is thoroughly rhetorical, with none of the syncopation found in the Arithmetica or in Brahmagupta's work. Even numbers were written out in words rather than symbols. It is quite unlikely that Al-Khwarizmi knew of the work of Diophantus, but he must have been familiar with at least the astronomical and computational portions of Brahmagupta. While neither Al-Khwarizmi nor other Arabic scholars made use of syncopation or of negative numbers, nevertheless, the Al-Jabr comes closer to elementary level level algebra of today than the works of either Diophantus or Brahmagupta. For the book is not concerned with difficult problems in indeterminate analysis, but with straightforward and elementary exposition of the solution of equations, especially of the second degree. The Arabs in general loved a good clear argument from premise to conclusion as well as systemic organization, respects in which neither Diophantus nor the Hindus excelled. The Hindus were strong in association and analogy, in intuition and an aesthetic and imaginative flair, whereas the Arabs were more practical-minded and down-to-earth in their approach to mathematics. Algebra or proto-algebra did exist before Al-Khwarizmi. He took influence from a number of sources like the Indians, the Babylonians, the Syrians and the Greeks, as evident by the problems and examples in his book. But he mixed them all taking what he believed to be useful. Some parts have clear influences, while others do not. But what I like the most about Al-Jabr is that it gives very nice and realistic examples at points. Inheritance distribution was, after all, one of the reasons that the book was written, so in places he used examples of exactly that. Al-Jabr was translated into Latin by Robert of Chester in 1145, after which it became a principal mathematics textbook in Europe and its universities. This is the place where it gets a bit boring for those of you who are not interested in mathematics. Al-Khwarizmi classified his problems into six standard forms as shown on the screen. If you remember from those classes you slept through, these equations are just multiple ways to express the general quadratic equation. However, Al-Khwarizmi has to write them this way to avoid negative numbers. Like mentioned before, algebra was mainly invented to solve practical everyday problems, and in most of those matters we don't use negative numbers. After all, no heir of a property ever gets a negative share. Through demonstrations, Al-Khwarizmi was, however, able to demonstrate that a quadratic equation can have multiple solutions. Al-Khwarizmi relied heavily on Greek geometry for his problems. He often drew line segments and rectangles to illustrate numbers. In order to solve a quadratic equation, Al-Khwarizmi even drew squares and actually added sides to them to find the roots. It's an incredible way of visualizing it in my opinion. Now, I'm going to mix the two things people love the most, history and mathematics. So let's get started. You can skip it if you like. So Al-Khwarizmi takes this equation. He draws a square with an area of x squared and each side of the length x. He has to add a total area of 10x to this square now. Since a square has 4 sides, he divides the value by 4, which results in 5x over 2. He adds rectangles of length x and width 5 over 2 on all 4 sides. The area of the new rectangles is 5 over 2 multiplied by x. However, the square is not complete. To fill the corners, he creates smaller squares. These are of the length 5 by 2 and of the area 25 by 4. The area of all four of these little squares is 25. Back to the equation. He adds 25 to both sides and simplifies it. The answer comes out to be 3. 
This example again shows why Al Khwarizmi ignored negative numbers. Since he thought of algebra in terms of real world measurements and length of a side cannot be negative, he did not consider it. It's because of Al Khwarizmi using examples like this that we have familiar terms like completing the square. It's probably because of him that we even use the term square to represent a power of two. Another mathematician named Abdul Hamid ibn Turk wrote and published a similar manuscript around the same time as Al Jabr, if not before it. In some cases, both Ibn Turk and Al Khwarizmi use similar demonstrations, and in one case, they even use the same equation as an example. It's unlikely that any of them plagiarized each other's work. Rather, what's possible is that some elementary foundation of algebra already existed, and both these men contributed to it. However, the reason that Al Jabr is more famously known is because of the influence of Al Khwarizmi as the head of the House of Wisdom, as well as his easier to understand way of explaining the problems and the solutions. Al Khwarizmi's Al Jabr was considered the go to book for solutions of equations. He passed away around the year 850 CE. However, he was only one of the first Islamic mathematicians. While his work relied heavily on those who came before it, his contributions to the modern world are, without a doubt, immense. Without him, it's likely that we would not even have the device that you're watching this video on. So, thanks to Al Khwarizmi for existing and doing all these great things, and thanks to you for watching. See you next time.